What is up everybody and welcome back to my channel. This is part two of the Sarah and Ryan Widmer case. If you've not already seen part one, I definitely suggest it or you're going to be very confused. It goes into the background, the circumstances, and it leads up to the arrest. And this is going into the trial, um, where we are currently, the evidence that was brought forward, and the theories in this case. So as a quick reminder for those of you that maybe took a little bit of a break between part one and part two, Ryan Widmer was arrested for aggravated murder just two days after his wife, Sarah Widmer, was found unresponsive in the bathtub of their home. It was ruled a drowning, but the manner of death was homicide. Like I said at the end of my last video, this was a huge shock to everyone involved when Ryan was arrested because he was a laid back, chill person. Both Sarah and Ryan's friends, especially Chris, who had known Ryan for a very long period of time, said that he had never even seen Ryan angry a single time since he'd known him. This man was never upset, never even got like remotely overexcited. He was so laid back and calm. And even Sarah's family believed there was no way that Ryan murdered her. Sarah's brother even showed up to court and begged that the bail be reduced for Ryan so that he could get out in order to come to Sarah's funeral. This is how much nobody involved across the board believed that he was involved in harming his wife. One, it was just a strange situation. Every single person repeated the same phrase through all of my research when I was looking into this when it came to Ryan, that he didn't have a mean bone in his body. And they're also, from what everyone knew, were not any marital issues either. They had just been married. Everyone saw them as the perfect couple. Neither of them had really complained to anyone at all that there was an issue. So it quite literally would have to mean that Ryan snapped in the middle of the most random time and killed Sarah and no one could wrap their head around it. On March 23rd, 2009, Ryan's first trial started at the Warren County Common Pleas Court and his attorney was Charlie Rickers. And Charlie genuinely believed that this was going to be a very easy case, open and shut, because from his perspective, as well as majority of people's perspectives, there was plenty of reasonable doubt here. There was no solid evidence. Everything was just pretty much based on the fact that he was the only person there and they couldn't explain her death otherwise, but also hadn't fully tested for other possibilities either. It just seemed like a really, really loose case. Prosecution came forward and in their list of particulars, they labeled that the method of death was Ryan drowning Sarah in the bathtub. So that's kind of what they were trying to prove happened. One of the things that the prosecution brought forward as evidence that there was something happening here and deception going on was that the 911 phone call was strange. According to many, Ryan seemed to not be very genuine in the phone call. He also contradicted statements that he said within the phone call, even just a few hours after it occurred when he was at the hospital and speaking to the nurses and the police officers. The dispatcher also said that it felt like he was oversharing. And this is a very big thing when it comes to listening to the demeanor you know, of someone in a 911 phone call. There's things that you expect to hear and things that you don't. And when someone is sharing a lot of information, um, sometimes it can come off in a way where it seems like they're trying to explain something to back a story or to set things up the way they want it to seem. So when he was bringing up the fact that he had been downstairs watching football and she was upstairs in the bath, a lot of people, including the prosecution, believe that that was him setting the stage of he wasn't anywhere near her when this happened. He was saying that he had already given CPR from what little he knew, that he had already drained the bathtub. He was kind of play by playing his um, things that he did. He also stated, I did everything I could. It was, it was very much centered around him and what he had done, which is never usually a good sign in a call like this. However, this 911 phone call and the dispatcher itself kind of flew under a lot of scrutiny after the trial because apparently <laughs> the dispatcher had been asleep immediately before answering this phone call. So, uh, this had been known since April of the prior year. It came out in a meeting that they had that there were different employees sleeping on the job while waiting for these 911 phone calls to come in. 
But for some strange reason, even though one of the people specifically accused of doing this had been the one to answer this phone call for this high profile murder case, the director of emergency management did not act on these allegations for over six months. And then once he did act on these allegations and knew that this was the same person that answered the Ryan Widmer phone call, he basically skirted around the truth when he spoke to the commissioner about it. He said, oh yeah, we're definitely addressing some disciplinary issues, but he failed to mention that they had to do with a freaking murder trial. Now, ultimately, it ended up being found that the dispatcher was in fact asleep prior to this 911 call with Ryan Widmer. It was clear that he was not making a lot of sense when he initially answered the phone call. Um, and I believe he was fired. And then on top of that, the director of emergency management was called out by authorities. And then he ended up resigning after working in that position for 20 years. So that caused its own little kind of disaster in the middle of this trial and towards the end of it. But I will say it ended up not actually affecting the trial itself. Ryan still acted how he would have acted when he called 911, um, despite the fact that this dispatcher did seem a little out of it at the start of this phone call. It was normal by the end of it, um, but it was just another thing added into this crazy story of what in the world is going on. Some individuals when it came to this 911 call also believed that the CPR Ryan is heard giving in the call was faked. Now this is infuriating because this is one of the parts that I cannot find in any of the edited versions of the 911 call. So if you want to hear it, you have to go and listen to the Generation Y podcast. They play it fairly early on, um, but they said that it doesn't sound real. You can definitely like hear too much in my opinion. You can hear him blowing the air into Sarah's mouth if that's what he was doing. But even the dispatcher told him to put the phone down because it almost seemed like he had the phone in his hand as he was trying to do it. So a lot of people thought that was very strange. But when it comes to really any solid evidence coming from the 911 phone call other than this doesn't sound quite right, that's pretty much it. But it did help establish a timeline that ended up being one of the most important parts of this trial all three times that it occurred. When the officers and EMT arrived, Sarah's body was dry and her hair was damp. And like we stated, they only arrived six and a half minutes after the 911 phone call was first made. And it took till about three minutes into the phone call when Ryan was told to get Sarah out of the bathtub and place her on the floor. Granted, also according to Ryan, the water had been drained out of this bathtub fully by the time he called 911. <sighs> now, nobody believed that there was any way Sarah could have dried off in that sort of time frame, that when authorities arrived, her body absolutely should have been wet. Nobody dried her off. There were no wet towels found to indicate this. Ryan never stated that he dried her off. It also would be kind of like a strange thing to do while there's an emergency happening around you. And this was kind of a big deal. And to top it off, there were a lot of arguments over the carpet that she was laying on as well. Authorities and EMTs stated that the carpet itself was not wet. So she wasn't wet, the carpet wasn't wet, and they apparently even took off their gloves to feel the carpet, which in my opinion is like the last thing that you do at a potential crime scene, especially if you think something's off. I feel like touching things with your bare hands probably not the most professional move, but they did. They said that it felt dry. Uh, but what's interesting about this is the prosecution was really pushing this, that everything was dry, everything was dry, but also their expert came forward and stated that all of the samples of the carpet that were taken were so wet that they destroyed the evidence bags. Like, the paper evidence bags were soaked through, the carpet was definitely wet, and the expert whose name, by the way, was Annette Davis, also said that when they were analyzing the pieces of carpet, the blood that was found in the carpet, I think it was a mixture of blood and feces, um, 
the way that it was spread out and the fact that it had reached the very back lining of the carpet indicated that it had been mixed with water. So there definitely was water on her body at some point to create all of this. And this is where the case gets very frustrating. The fact that the prosecution's main stance is, oh, there's no way this was a staged scene because she was already dry. There's no way her whole body was in this bathtub. When the expert that they even brought forward is stating that the samples of the carpet are definitely wet and the samples were taken from right under her hips where there was a stain of blood and then right up by her head where there was a stain of blood. And if both of those are wet, I think it's safe to say that at least the bottom back part of her body had been wet when she was placed on the carpet. But it's frustrating because the science is saying, yes, it was wet, but people are saying, yeah, but her body wasn't wet, so he's definitely guilty. The prosecution and defense also argued heavily over the lack of water in the bathroom as well. Lead investigator Lieutenant Jeff Braley took the stand. His testimony backed up other cops' observations about items found inside the bathroom. What, if anything, did you observe about their condition? They were also dry. The defense came back accusing Bradley of jumping to conclusions. You didn't know what the environment was like in the bedroom and bathroom, temperature-wise, did you? That's correct. You didn't know what the environment was like humidity-wise, did you? That's also correct. The prosecution stated that because there was a lack of water, it's very likely that he hadn't actually picked her up and pulled her out of the bathtub. And they supported this with the fact that the bottles as well had remained on the side of the tub. But again, this was an issue because there were also wet magazines found on the floor of the bathroom. Um, so it's just almost feeling very nitpicky at this point. But they were suggesting that he basically staged the scene, that he cleaned things up afterwards, wiped everything down, put the bottles back. Sure. And the top and the side of the tub, you can see that there are, are marks that show that there was a rag, a swirl around the top of this. Somebody had tried to wipe it down. Now, when they did it, I don't know. And this ended up leading to another argument and then a change of position when it comes to the prosecution. The prosecution decided halfway through the trial to change their bill of particulars to state that he may have drowned her in the bathtub, but he also may have drowned her in the sink or the toilet. The defense fought against this, saying that by them changing the location, they believe that, you know, Ryan drowned Sarah, that they had absolutely no solid theory as to what actually happened and no solid proof to say that this actually happened or they would know a better idea of the location in which it happened. Prosecution at this point tried to prove that there was at the very least a struggle. And this was going to be hard because all of the EMTs, as well as the police officers that arrived on scene said that they did not see any indication at all that there was a struggle within the bathroom. So they decided to dust the bathtub for prints. And there was apparently a forearm mark like up against the edge of the bathtub where the bathtub met the wall. And they also were able to find streaks kind of running down the back of the bathtub as if someone had taken their hands and dragged them down. Now the prosecution stated that these streaks that were coming down after being dusted appeared to be very small and therefore it was likely that they came from Sarah. You can't tell how hard the hand pushed on the tub. <coughs> no, sir. Criminalist William Hillard couldn't say how long these handprints have been on the back of the tub or whose they were, but seemed confident they were fingertip prints that had been sliding downward. Hillard also pointed out a forearm print on the tub. When they and put all of this together, their claim was that clearly to explain the fact that there was no water on Sarah's body, that she had not actually gotten into the tub and that it was more likely her body was out of the tub and her head and everything was shoved in. So her arms would have been out in front of her and they're claiming that she was clawing at the tub in order to get her head up out of the water. And when it came to the forearm print that was up against the tub, they believe that was there. Um, it was Ryan's way basically of stabilizing himself as he was pushing her head under. And they supported this even further by saying that this explained the different bruising on the nape of her neck and her scalp because her head was being held down underwater. Um, depending on how, you know, far into the bathtub she was, it may have explained uh, the bruising on the chest if her chest was being pressed up against the side of the tub. But again, we come to the exact same problem that they didn't have any science whatsoever to really prove this. 
They were unable to lift any of the prints in the bathroom. There were no prints. There was no way to say if any of these marks were from Ryan or from Sarah. Now I have seen on a very limited resources, so please do not quote me on this, but I think that they tested the hair follicle or something. They tested something that was found near the forearm print and they were able to say that it was from a, a male, I believe, but I think that's like the furthest they got with it when it came to a science. There also was no accurate way at all to figure out when exactly any of these streaks or prints were left on the bathtub. It also is pretty much impossible to tell if the streaks that were left on the back of the bathtub were left by someone that was smaller and had smaller hands or someone that was larger. And this ended up being kind of proven more later on in an episode of Reasonable Doubt after they took on the case and looked at all of the information and they tested it with an expert. And it was two people, two different size hands. They did the same kind of motion and it looks pretty much the same. So while yes, it's possible that this came from Sarah when she was trying to maybe get her head above water and then maybe that arm print was there while Ryan was putting pressure on her, there was no scientific way to prove it. And it's equally as possible that those marks were just there from someone getting out of the tub or those marks were just there from someone wiping something off and that the arm print may have been there from someone cleaning the bathtub or someone draining, like leaning over to drain the water out of the bathtub or even it's possible that this came from the person that removed the bathtub from the home. It's that wide open, you guys. Very, very wide open. And again, when it comes to these different marks that are on the tub, it's important to note that it's also a theory of the prosecution that this was a crime scene that had been cleaned up. That's how they explained the lack of water. Because first of all, let's say that this was a struggle. She would have been flailing her arms around. There would be water going everywhere. Bottles probably would have fallen over. So yeah, I can see how you could think this was a cleaned up job. They even also found a Lysol wipe sitting on the bathtub. However, no blood was found at all in the bathtub. This Lysol wipe also could have been sitting there because it was cleaned. I know that I personally clean off the ledge of the bathtub before I take a bath because hair from everyone showering gets on there and I rest my arm up on it and it's gross if it's dirty. So that's even something that I've personally myself done before. But also if you were drowning someone in a bathtub and you wanted to get rid of evidence at the bathtub, that would be the one thing you would wipe. So there wouldn't be any prints left over on the bathtub. So there goes part of the idea that he cleaned things up. Also, why would he clean up water when water being in an area like that would be expected at a drowning and just in a bathroom in general. And also there were no wet towels found absolutely anywhere. And this led to another argument about self-defense and the fact that he may have shoved Sarah in the water to drown her because there would have been a fight again, leading to water again, potentially making these marks in the bathtub. But EMTs and officers also that first reported to the scene testified that they saw Ryan in his boxers. That's what all he was wearing when they arrived and none of them noticed any sort of marks on him. There was no redness as if, you know, someone had been grabbing at him or smacking him. There were no scratches and they could pretty much see majority of his body at this point. Also when he was arrested two days later and they checked him for any sort of marks on his body, they didn't find any of those either. So he completely lacked any evidence of that. And Sarah also entirely lacked evidence of defensive wounds. Her nails were fully intact and very freshly manicured on both her fingernails and her toes. So there was no breaking of the nails like you would typically see if someone was fighting and scratching at someone. And when they scraped her nails to test for DNA, obviously Ryan's DNA, there was none of it. There was none of Ryan's DNA underneath her fingernails. I have seen that underneath the nails of her right hand, there was unknown female DNA. And so this obviously could bring forward another potential person of interest. However, they tested this, you know, just in case against all of the different women that had been at the scene that night. They tested against her own mother just to be sure, and they were never able to find out 
who this DNA belonged to. Male. I think it's a lot less likely to find a full DNA profile of another individual um, under somebody's fingernails if they've been soaking in a bathtub for a while. Late this afternoon, questioning revolved around the entire bathroom. Leading and this kind of created a whole other issue because then this led towards the fact of, okay, well, she had someone's DNA under her nails. And if she had been soaking in the bathtub for as long as Ryan said she had been, this would have washed away. So, you know, maybe she just didn't get to him, like didn't scratch him, didn't, you know, fight back much. Maybe she was more focused about getting herself out of the water. And this would explain why there's none of his DNA under her nails. And there's still someone else's when it probably should have washed away had she taken a bath. It's just like this giant spiral that I feel like you keep going down in this case where it's so easy to argue in circles because there's just nothing solid to really grasp onto. And that one piece of evidence I've kind of thought about forever. <laughs> That's basically the one main thing that I've thought about is the fact that there's no evidence that there was a, a fight or a struggle. And it's not just down to there wasn't evidence of that in the bathroom. There's no evidence of that on Ryan or Sarah either. And you would expect that, you know, this, is something intense. This is a drowning. Every bit of your body is screaming at that point to get above water and get oxygen. So you don't just not fight against that. And I've been trying to think of every way possible that Ryan may have been able to drown Sarah where this would be the scenario, that there were no markings under her nails, that there was no sign of a struggle in the bathroom. Um, and it's just kind of hard to. The only thing that I can think of is that he would be behind her pushing her into the water potentially with her bent over the bathtub. But even then, it's very easy to reach your hands down and grab behind your neck where his hand would have been and where they're claiming his hands were because of the bruising that is found. Um, you know, I can definitely see where someone will be trying to push themselves out of the water, but your first instinct as a human, your first response is going to be what is keeping me underwater address that problem. That problem would have been Ryan's hands. That would have likely been the first thing she would have gone for. And you know, even if it was just her upper body in the water, if she was reaching out in front of her and clawing at things, water is probably splashing. Now, there had to have been a decent amount of water in the bathtub if he was able to hold her head under the water, um, which means that there definitely would have been splashing and there would have been more water, you know, flying everywhere. And also I would expect bottles to be moved and, um, there are some people that speculate that maybe he just held her head under a running faucet and that's what happened. Uh, I feel like that would maybe be a little bit more difficult to accomplish. And a lot of people, especially as experts stated that then she would have some sort of trauma from hitting her head on the faucet more than likely. And that wasn't there. So it's just who the heck even knows. And then that brought attention to the bruises on Sarah since it was being fought again at this point that they came from Ryan shoving her body under the water, some sort of altercation. Many experts came forward totally contradicting each other, which that's kind of the last thing that you want in a situation like this where everyone in everyone needed some sort of clarity here. Not because foul play was involved, but because of the level of life-saving measures that were taken. Sarah had CPR for 45 minutes straight. 45 minutes, numerous intubations that were not working. Her whole body was being kind of adjusted as needed to try to get the intubations to work, to encourage the CPR to work. And this expert said that these you know, people that are trained to save lives, the measures that they take, they're not worried about putting a bruise on someone if it's going to help them get in a better position to save that person's life. So sometimes it can be rough and there are markings that are left because who cares about a bruise when you were, you know, saved from drowning. So they expected to see more injuries, more bruising in other places, um, you know, potentially even some small fractures and this wasn't seen. There were even other experts that came forward saying that they also expected to see this kind of bruising, especially because she had drowned, because your cells eventually start to just fill with water and they will explode and you will bruise easier. And you add on top of that things like chest compressions, 
you can see what, what I'm getting at here. You know, even just like the pressure of holding her head down against the floor and moving it, you can see how there could potentially be bruising back here. So many experts said this is totally possible, but then the prosecution brought experts forward that said, no, absolutely not. This is not consistent whatsoever to any sort of life saving measures. And I believe even the coroner also stated very bluntly, there's no way this is where they came from. Trying to put doubt in jurors' minds, defense attorney Jay Clark suggested maybe Sarah wasn't in the tub yet, maybe had a seizure and fell in, and maybe that would also explain her bruises on her head. Injuries the Warren County coroner later testified were caused by a blow to that area. Uh, my opinion, it would be uh, a couple of different things, either some type of uh, significant compressional force, some type of you know, force of being applied to the front of the neck, or potentially some type of, of, a, of a blunt force uh, injury. So it, it could be either some type of blow or trauma directly to that area. Uh, versus some type of sustained uh, compression or squeezing of that particular area. And do you have an opinion as to whether or not those injuries occurred before or after her demise? Uh, yes, I have an opinion. And what is that opinion? That they happened before her demise. Dr. Updegrove later told jurors he believes Sarah was murdered. Do you have an opinion as to what the manner of death of Sarah Winmer was? Yes. What is that, sir? Homicide. So then they decided to bring forward a sleep expert because they're like, okay, you know, we've spoken a lot about if this was something intentional, you know, we need to now rule out the idea that this could have been an accident. So a sleep expert came in because the defense and Ryan had stated since this all happened that Sarah likely fell asleep in the bathtub. This expert was able to say that that is very, very unlikely. There are many different things that our body responds to to prevent things like that from happening. If something like that does happen, if it's an accident and you're in the bathtub and someone does drown, more times than not, it's because there are drugs involved or there's alcohol involved. Something that is making another part of your body incapable of setting off the alarms. So when if you were to fall asleep in the bathtub and you were to slip underneath the water, the first thing that would kind of wake you up would be the water hitting your face. We have an automatic kind of reaction to, you know, wake up and perk up when that happens. Even if someone splashes water quickly, you guys, I'm sure you've all experienced it. You kind of like <laughs> jump a little bit. So that likely would have been the first line of defense her body would have put forward. The second one would have been her gag reflex because she would have attempted to breathe in and instead would have gotten water. And that would have been the second thing that would have woken her up. And the very third thing would have been oxygen, low oxygen levels. Let's say for some reason her body held its breath underwater naturally, which is something that can happen. The low oxygen levels should have woken her up. So there are many different stops along the way if it was her just falling asleep in the bathtub where she should have woken up so the fact that she didn't and her toxicology report ultimately did come back clean meant that there was something else going on that maybe they were unaware of that caused this or ryan really did do something or at least someone did something but by his own admission ryan said he was the only one in the house that night pretty much leaving him to be the only one possible. So at this point, there's definitely a lot of questionable information and no one could really deny that. The way that Ryan contradicted himself in the 911 phone call was definitely strange and why would he need to do that? The oversharing of information, why was the downstairs TV on, not on the channel that he said it was on, but his channel was on upstairs. Was she maybe downstairs watching something and then some sort of argument happened and she came upstairs? no one really knows and then on top of that it is kind of strange the situation in the bathroom with the lack of water um, and then on her body they did all sorts of testing in the reasonable doubt episode and her body absolutely should have been wet and it wasn't and that didn't make any sense but then with the large things lacking like the physical evidence or defensive wounds you know pretty much anything solid this was a difficult one and to top it off the prosecution never put forward a motive. And I do want to state that the prosecution does not legally have to form a motive, which I feel like a lot of people are confused about. They do have to establish intent, which is something different, the intention to kill someone. 
But motive is not something that they legally have to do. But a lot of people do it because it helps bring a story together. And I feel like, especially in a case like this, where there is a lot of information lacking, I wish a motive would have been brought forward to maybe make some of this make sense. Because from what I'm seeing, just as someone examining the facts after the fact, at least the ones that have been put out publicly, this puzzle does not come together properly for me. They found absolutely no issues at all in the marriage that led to a motive. There was no life insurance policy. Uh, there also was no financial issues within the marriage. So money wasn't a motive. Neither of them expressed to anyone that they were having any troubles in their marriage. Um, there was also no evidence that either of them had an affair. So that wasn't a part of a motive. On the surface, it genuinely seemed like there was nothing. Authorities dug deeper and deeper and nothing at all was found. Add to that the fact that Ryan, no one could say anything bad about him, that Sarah's family was even shocked that this was even a possibility. The fact that his friends stood by him and said they'd never even seen him get angry before. It didn't make any sense. And I understand that there is something that needs to be acknowledged. The fact that there are plenty of things that happen in relationships that the world does not see. A relationship can look great to friends and family and everyone, and there are plenty of things that could be going on behind closed doors that no one knows about. And that easily could have been the case when it came to Ryan and Sarah. However, there were no nasty text messages. There were no nasty emails. I mean, there was no inkling of an idea. And on top of that, you would think that by that point, she would have said something to someone. Um, you know, I feel like in every case that we look into that reaches this sort of point at any point of time, usually the victim has stated to someone there is some level of fear. There's some hint or cry for help being put out there and there just wasn't one. They had just planned a trip. They just built a deck. They were planning out their life. So this is quite literally out of left field. No motive was found at all. So did he really just snap? After two weeks, the trial ended, and after 23 hours of deliberation, Ryan was found not guilty of aggravated murder, but he was found guilty of murder. But just months later in April, the trial ended up being entirely thrown out. A juror came forward stating that a few of the other jurors involved in Ryan's first trial performed their own tests at home. They tested, I believe, carpet drying rates or the drying rates of their body straight out of the bathtub. And once they performed these tests in their own home, they then came to the rest of the jurors. They shared this information, which directly influenced their decision. And they are being influenced by totally not scientific and DIY tests done at a random person's house. And it's kind of frustrating because I feel like that is so something that I would do. I understand the curiosity and wanting to know something for yourself and have answers for yourself. It kind of makes me frustrated because that to me tells me that no one did that in the trial, that neither the prosecution or the defense thought it'd be a good idea to test drying times to prove either of their arguments on this, which as a juror, I would have been frustrated as well. And despite that curiosity being there, you simply cannot perform a test as if you know the variables and all the information needed to get the outcome that would have occurred in the same circumstance as just a random juror getting information. Um, and then that determines someone's guilt. So because of that, they decided to throw out the guilty verdict. Now, I do want to say that during all of this, the prosecutor also came forward at a press conference about the initial trial and stated that while they never spoke about a motive in court, that they did find that Ryan had been visiting these different websites. Now I've seen that there are like dating websites or just websites where you meet people and it could potentially be women. I've even seen that this person said he visited like pornography websites and that the prosecutor believed this could have triggered a large argument between Ryan and Sarah the night of her death. And 
I think that the prosecutor even went as far as to speculate that Sarah had found out about these websites and found out what Ryan was doing because he had visited a few of them not shortly um, before Sarah was found dead in the bathtub. The majority of it was speculation. I just wanted to let you guys know about that. On May 10th, 2010, the second trial began and it was the same arguments all over again, all surrounding the same controversial pieces of evidence. This time Ryan's new lawyer decided to take an approach of kind of picking away at the discrepancies in all of the records. This time around, they were also very focused on the possibility that Sarah had some sort of underlying illness that could have caused her to drown because at this point, the sleep expert kind of ruled out that she fell asleep, which was their main idea. So they were approaching it from a different way. Well, Sheree, we learned today that a Hamilton Township paramedic was suspended for not following protocol the night Sarah Widmer died. Police and paramedics were test te testifying today for prosecutors, saying that what we've heard before, Sarah's body was dry and so was the bathroom, and no one noticed pruning on Sarah's fingers and toes. But in cross-examination, the defense tried to discredit first responders, pointing out a discrepancy with a medical run report from the night Sarah died. There should only be one per patient and today the defense presented two different versions. Records presented today also show Sarah was put on the ambulance at 1103 that night and not taken to the hospital until 1115. When asked why it took the ambulance 12 minutes to leave, the paramedic said he doesn't recall it being that long and that too must be a discrepancy. Way. Now I know that some point during these trials, a forensic pathologist known as Dr. Warner Spitz did perform a second autopsy. I don't know if it was at the second trial um, or between the first and the second. They've not been very clear about this, but the second autopsy was done to try to see if there were any underlying conditions that could help prove this theory. Now, unfortunately, the initial coroner likely should have checked for these things. Um, they could be mainly located in the heart or the brain, but he didn't. So that's why the second coroner was brought in. But also, unfortunately, the initial coroner didn't properly preserve Sarah's brain or her heart. And she had been cremated. So it was kind of important to preserve these things. And a judge had ordered that things like that be properly preserved because it was a criminal case. Because of this, the pathologist was able to say that the cause of death was drowning, but it was an unknown manner of death because all of the answers that could explain what may have happened would have lied in her heart or her brain. And without testing that, they couldn't get anywhere else. But the manner of death definitely was not a homicide in this pathologist's opinion. Corner, Dr. Russell Uptegrove never examined the parts of the brain that would have showed whether Sarah had a seizure. See, the defense's theory is Sarah had some kind of medical event like a seizure and drowned. He also said the manner in which Sarah died was not a homicide. There was drowning. We know that. That's cause of death. Okay. Uh, the manner is undetermined. All right, just so I'm clear. Yes, you have an opinion. Correct. Objection. What is your opinion? The manner of death is undetermined. Uh, during cross-examination, prosecutors tried to use Balco to undermine the testimony of Dr. Warner Spitz. Spitz is the one who did the second autopsy on Sarah Widmer, and Balco said he, too, did not examine her body as thorough as he would have done. Reporting live tonight in Lebanon, Karen Johnson, News 5. Karen. Also during the second trial, Sarah's mother took the stand for the very first time, and when all of this initially started, Sarah's family supported Ryan, as you know, but by the time the first trial started, they weren't supporting him anymore. Now, I haven't seen that it was anything malicious. I don't think it was any animosity. I don't think they ever came out and said that they definitely thought Ryan did anything. At least I haven't personally seen that. It just seems like they kind of stepped to the side. And based on what Ryan said, he said he thinks it's because they felt like they were in a really weird position. I mean, he was being charged for their daughter's murder and, you know, kind of supporting him might feel strange. It's a, it's a gross position to be in, but I haven't seen it's anything really negative. And she didn't go on the first trial. She didn't go on stand, but she did on the second. And she said that she didn't believe Sarah had any sort of heart condition or brain condition whatsoever that would have led to her 
um, drowning in the bathtub. She said that there was never a time in Sarah's life where she, you know, really believed there was anything health wise going on with her. She also said that she was unaware that Sarah would fall asleep like all of her friends were stating and Ryan was saying. She said that she did know Sarah struggled from headaches and that they believed they were likely due to migraines, like it was a migraine issue, um, and that around those times she would sleep a lot, but she said she wasn't aware of anything else. She also pointed out that the relationship seemed a little bit stressed to her at the time, the relationship between Sarah and Ryan. And this was actually the first time anyone had noted any issues within the marriage. Like I said, they couldn't even form a motive or bring forward any issues in the very first trial. learned about so, Sarah Widmer's life from her mother today. Ruth Ann Stewart took the stand and shared impressions of her son-in-law, who's accused of killing her daughter. Deb Silverman's covering Ryan Widmer's third trial. She's live in Lebanon with the emotional words the jury had to take in today. Deb. Friend in Ruth Ann Stewart made it clear that she was not thrilled with the man her daughter chose to marry. She wiped her eyes several times as she talked about her daughter's medical history. Stewart testified that when Sarah was a baby, a doctor thought she might have had a heart murmur, but that was quickly ruled out. She said Sarah had sinus problems, but didn't complain much about headaches or stomach problems like her friends claimed she did. The grieving mother also told the jurors she never saw her daughter fall asleep in strange places. Stewart did have issues with how her daughter and son-in-law talked to each other. She described it as hateful. Ryan and I and Sarah would paint the house and stuff, and we I'd go for supper, you know. I and they were they were okay together. I mean, they they argued, you know, and they. They talk to each other different than I ever talked to my husband, but that's the generation difference. What happened? Stewart says sometimes she'd tell the couple to stop picking on each other because she couldn't take it. So whether this is, you know, critical because of the situation that's going on or if it was just typical marriage bickering, we're unsure, but she said that it wasn't as perfect as everyone said it was. This trial basically went through the same motions. It was a little bit shorter than the first one. And then after 30 hours of the deliberation from the jury, they were deadlocked, you guys. They could not unanimously agree that he was either guilty or not guilty. This was not expected at all. There were a lot of jurors that said that as soon as they started hearing information about this case, that they strongly believed this one was gonna be very easy, that there was tons of reasonable doubt that couldn't possibly be overlooked, but then there was definitely a good portion of the jury that believed without a doubt he was guilty of murdering his wife. Now the defense saw this as a win because at least it wasn't a guilty verdict. And the prosecution, I think, kind of realized that their argument wasn't as strong as they believed it was. And because there was a huge lack of like very serious evidence, there was no smoking gun, there was nothing like that, that it was going to be very difficult to convince a jury again that he was guilty. But the defense tried to not even allow that to happen. And they actually asked for an acquittal because they said that there was a heart murmur that was introduced into the second trial. Sarah had a heart murmur and it should have been introduced earlier on according to the defense and that should have been something again that was looked into by the coroner when she initially had her autopsy and it wasn't and that was just another health issue added to other things that allowed other possibilities to be more likely when it came to reasons for death and manner of death. The judge, however, denied the acquittal. So at this point, there was a very large website running for Ryan to support him. And it's still running to this day, but I have not seen any posts since 2018. And this was drawing in a lot of attention from the entire country. Dateline aired an episode on Ryan. I think it was drawing in so much attention because Ryan did not go on the stand in his first trial or in his second, which a lot of people fully disagreed with and thought was very strange behavior. But also a lot of people hadn't heard his side of the story. So when the Dateline episode aired and he had this website that shared his side of the story, people felt like they were getting information for the first time. And so people were eating it up like crazy. And it also drew in a lot of women, which is not too surprising. So, 
I guess there were quite a few of them that he was speaking to, but there was one in particular that he met through this website and her name was also Sarah and they ended up dating and they ended up having a baby. This all happened like during the second trial and after. And when this released, everyone lost their marbles. They were like, this is the strangest behavior. He's definitely guilty. You know, this man is going through what should be the hardest time in his life. First of all, he's being accused of something that he's claiming he didn't do. And second of all, he's going through it two times now, entering a third. And everyone thought there's no way this man should be focused on a relationship with also a woman with the exact same name as his wife that he's accused of killing and then go on to have a child with them. But there was also another portion of people that said that he had you know, no support really, and he wanted someone to be there for him and to have his back during the trial. And this is something that made him happy, so whatever. But this definitely went every possible direction opinion-wise in the public. Two weeks prior to the third trial, Ryan was offered a plea deal, which I found very interesting. Um, I kind of assumed that would happen during the first trial, but um, even the second trial, but the fact that it took this long, I was a little taken back, but they basically offered that he would take a manslaughter charge in exchange for only five years in prison. And he was looking at 15 to life with the charges that he currently had. And Ryan said, hell no, he would not take this plea deal. He said that there was no way that he would ever admit to something that he didn't do. So on January 26th, 2011, the third trial started. And you guys, this is so long. Like I'm, I'm, I don't know if you can hear it. I'm literally losing my voice. I told you this is a lot of information, but this third trial was a roller coaster. Holy crap. It was a roller coaster. So it was the same information just for the third time. Um, and Ryan put a lot into his defense. He put in $250,000 into his defense and he figured that bringing in a lot of experts would help his case because the prosecution didn't scientifically back a lot of their information. The few times that they attempted to bring in things like these finger smears and stuff, even that wasn't really backed by any science. So, I'm assuming he thought it'd be easy to kind of shut down the prosecution and be found not guilty. But for some reason, they limited the amount of experts that he could bring, the judge did. And if any of you out there are familiar with situations like this, if you're a lawyer, if you're a judge, whoever it is that's watching this, I wanna know if that's common or not because I feel like I've never heard that before. I understand there's like rules and regulations when it comes to bringing in evidence and you know, you do have to enter it in and all of that. Like you can't just spring things on last minute. However, I have not once heard limiting the information that is brought into a case. I feel like in a, in a fair trial, you should be allowed to bring in relevant information, no matter how much it is, as long as it is helping prove your point. So I don't know if that's normal or I'm just freaking out for no reason. Once the trial started, it was the same kind of back and forth with the experts. The initial coroner took the stand again and testified that the bruises on Sarah's body were done prior to her death, meaning that they occurred during a struggle. However, I personally like question a lot. I mean, obviously they did CPR on Sarah for 45 minutes. I feel like they wouldn't have done that had she still had like a slight pulse or something happening. They attempted to intubate her. Um, they even stated on stand that her body was still warm when they got there. I know that doesn't necessarily mean she was still alive, but I feel like the prosecution kind of pointing that out as in the only way to explain that is that Ryan drowned her and used physical force. I, I would love to know if it's still possible that she was in a point at that time where her blood was still flowing, bruises could still form when they were performing CPR. Then they brought in two women. Now these two women Ryan met through the website, the support website, and I guess he'd been speaking frequently to them. I think it was a regular thing for him to hand his phone number out to people so that they could call him. He could talk about the trial, the things he was going through emotionally. And one woman brought a pretty crazy claim to the table in this third trial. Her name was Jennifer Crew, and she claimed that Ryan admitted to her over the phone that he did in fact murder Sarah. And this was 
huge. This was like a surprise witness that the prosecution brought in. It was a protected witness, I think. And it shocked everyone. They had a live blog going on when this trial was happening and it was the highest numbers they had seen so far. I think throughout all of the trials, people were losing it because they, at this point, I think everyone speculated if he really did it, which I think is a pretty fair thing to feel. But when you have someone come forward and say, it's this girl that he met on this website and he's like, Oh yeah, I definitely killed her. According to this woman, according to Jennifer crew, one night Ryan called her and he was very upset. He was crying and he said, I did it. I did it. I killed Sarah. According to what Jennifer said, Ryan said that Sarah fought with him that night over something. I think one of these websites that was mentioned on the press conference and asked for a divorce because of it. And Ryan's response was that he punched her in the chest. Ryan then told her that allegedly that he blacked out after this. And then when he came to Sarah was laying on the ground in the bathroom where they had had this argument and that her head was wet. And the way that Jennifer stated it was just a little bit strange. And there were lots of holes in the story, but pretty quickly her testimony was ignored by essentially everyone. All the information that Jennifer brought forward was information that she could have created her own story about or known from the different trials. Um, she could have known and created a theory off of, she could have known and created the story off of what the first prosecutor said about motive after the first trial. And when she was cross-examined by the defense, her story fell apart. She knew like no details. Um, it didn't seem very genuine. And the second witness that was called to the stand, the second woman claimed that she also spoke to Ryan that night and he was not upset. He never said anything like that to her. And while that doesn't prove he never said it, this woman, Jennifer Crew, was just not very reliable. It came out that she apparently had a pretty large history of lying starting from when she met Ryan. So when she initially messaged Ryan and emailed him, she sent him pictures of herself, except they were not herself. They were pictures of someone else. And she pretended to be this person in these pictures this entire time. She had been known in the past for using fake names. She had used fake social security numbers before. She was involved in drugs for an extended period of time. Um, she was just not someone that had a very honest history. I mean, she started off her relationship speaking to Ryan by catfishing him. Between that, her story falling apart and the other female witness, she was pretty much disregarded. Another issue, however, in this third trial was Detective Braley. According to Ryan's website, and this didn't actually come up in the third trial, um, they tried to have it come up and it was shut down immediately. But according to Ryan's website, Detective Braley, who was the first detective that was called into the scene to look into everything that was there for the first autopsy that was there when it was deemed a homicide, um, he supplied false information on his application to even become a police officer at the station. He lied about his level of education. He lied about his experience. That could mean the entire thing was compromised from the second he set foot in that house. And he was the only one there when this autopsy occurred. Um, it was just a big problem. Detective Braley also had a history of being dishonest when, you know, just working within the department. And he also had apparently a few other pretty decent sized issues with other cases that he had previously worked on. And the defense tried to get this into court because Detective Braley wasn't even working for this police department anymore because of this. It wouldn't allow the defense to bring any of this in there. But for some reason, again, it was shut down. The defense also tried to bring in the fact that the bathtub was apparently illegally seized. There's a list of items that were taken on the warrant for the home. You know, they have to get a warrant to take everything out and forensically analyze it. But the bathtub was not on that list, but they still took the bathtub. And then that bathtub then supplied them with one of the biggest, um, I guess, pieces of evidence that determined a lot of the different jurors decision in the case, which were the like different fingerprints and the forearm mark but that bathtub and that evidence probably shouldn't have ever been introduced because it was illegally taken from the home. But again, this was shot down by the judge. 
Also during this trial, one of the lawyers, one of Ryan's lawyers received information that one of the jurors that was currently on the trial had made comments indicating prejudice against Ryan, which is not allowed and he should have been thrown off and they should have gotten a new juror in. But despite bringing this information forward, this man was kept as a juror. So I just don't understand how an original investigating officer, the detective assigned to the case being known as being incompetent and a liar. I don't see how that isn't an issue that would affect the trial or the case in general. Um, illegally seized items from the home. I don't see how that's not an issue. The issue with the fact that a juror, you know, for the second time, a juror kind of screwed him the juror being prejudiced against him and that being ignored. It's just like one thing after another. And I feel like he was just being shut down every way he turned. And again, whether he's guilty or not, based on your own opinion or the evidence that was brought forward, it is a right to a fair trial. And I personally do not believe that that's what he got. And that could be you, that could be anyone, that could be someone that you love one day. And if that happened to them, that could ruin their life and they could be innocent. And there's a reason why these things are in place. And so it's really frustrating to see it not play out the way that it legally should. Ultimately, the jurors ended up finding Ryan guilty at the third trial. So for the second time, Ryan was found guilty and he was sentenced to 15 years to life in prison. Ryan, do you want to say anything? Do you have anything to say at all? Anything to say? Ryan, you love me. I'm innocent. We know this is difficult for you. What do you want people to know? I'm innocent. I would never hurt my wife. Never. You did not kill what your wife? What happened? Absolutely not. I just pulled Anything right there? What what happens now? Anything else? Do you think you have any? I know this is difficult for you. Do you think? You just leave him alone. <laughs> <laughs> Jurors came forward after the trial stating that the largest thing that influenced their opinion was that he wasn't acting like someone should act after they had lost their wife, which is also something that's deeply upsetting to me because I feel like we're all very quick to jump on how someone should act. And to an extent, I think that's important. It's important to analyze people's behavior. However, I also think it's important to understand that this man had gone through this three times at this point. He had been through three trials and anyone who has been a part of a trial understands that those drain you emotionally, physically, everyone involved, no matter what position they're in in a trial, it's exhausting. And so I think it's kind of unfair to say, oh yeah, I, I thought he was guilty because he acted like he wasn't shocked by her autopsy photos when he had been having these shoved in his face numerous times now over the past couple of years. The jurors also said the other main things that they focused on were the fingerprints, which to me is also upsetting because there is literally no way to prove that they were from either Sarah or Ryan or when they were from. So they also found him guilty based on something that isn't even proven to have happened that night or belonged to either of them. And also the timing of the 911 call and Sarah being dry. And that to me is the largest piece of evidence that they have. The fact that Sarah had dried off in three minutes, the testing that was done after the fact, not even for the trials, they had someone sit there for eight minutes and she still wasn't dry. In April of 2012, Ryan's appellate attorney, Michelle Barry Godsey, filed two different appeals. She filed that the bathtub was illegally seized and that there was bad science being used in regards to these fingerprints. She also argued that Sarah's DNA should be used for genetic testing because at this point, they're really honing into this idea that there was some sort of medical issue happening and they did preserve her DNA. It was ordered by a judge. So a simple DNA test, even though it is expensive, could potentially show if there were any sort of genetic conditions, um, diseases, abnormalities that may have caused her drowning. But by September, all of those appeals had been denied. 
But in November of 2012, they filed another appeal with the Supreme Court, which then was denied in January of 2013. So a second appeal was filed to the Supreme Court in February of 2013, which was then denied by May. And then finally, in 2014, a writ of habeas corpus was filed. And I spoke about a writ of habeas corpus in the Darlie Routier case, which if you haven't watched that one, it's exactly like this case. So go watch that. Um, but basically habeas corpus translate to, if I'm remembering correctly, like bring the body or bring forward the body. And it means exactly that a habeas corpus basically states that if a prisoner believes that they're being wrongfully illegally detained in prison, um, and that their constitutional rights were broken. They want to be seen by a judge to explain this, fight this, and then be released from prison. They had a total of six different assignments of error and one dozen grounds of relief within this habeas corpus that they filed. Um, it included the bathtub being taken again, the DNA, um, Detective Braley actually was involved in this potential mis misconduct situation um, and the fingerprints and the bad science that was used. But from what I've seen, to this day, nothing has been answered. Um, and this was filed in 2014. The attorney general that is handling the state level appeal pretty much directly came forward after the habeas corpus was filed, stating that the habeas corpus needed to be denied. She said that she feels Widmer did not really establish his case, indicating that there was any unfairness or wrongdoing at all, and that the search and seizure issue issues should have been dealt with and litigated at a state level. And because they weren't, that the federal level should just totally ignore them. But another issue with this is that in the second and third trial, the defense did come forward and bring up the issues of the bathtub and the search and seizure problem. The fact that it was illegally taken or at least wasn't listed on the warrant. And I guess this motion was filed untimely. So the judge denied it. So it wasn't, it was definitely, it should have been filed on time. I think that definitely should have been something that was of importance. Um, I don't know how they managed to file it untimely two times, especially if it meant that much to them. However, I wasn't a part of that. I have no clue what all was going on at that time, um, but it definitely was brought up as an issue at the state level and just didn't move forward. The thing as well is that filing a writ of habeas corpus is kind of like a final last ditch effort. Like it is the last thing that most people try in this situation in order to get themselves out of what is happening. And it doesn't end up going the way that they want most of the time from the experience of the cases that I've seen it used in. So we'll see if by some crazy chance something happens in that in the next couple of years. But other than that, he's actually eligible for parole by 2025. So there's a chance he can be released on parole in just a couple of years. So since all of this, a lot more information has come forward and a book called Submerged ended up being published by a reporter that covered all of the trials and just really couldn't shake it. And Ryan Widmer allowed her access to all of the lawyer's files, every single thing from start to finish. And she went through all of it. And it is now strongly believed and suggested in this book that Sarah more than likely drowned because of an illness and that the DNA absolutely needs to be needs to be tested to rule that out or prove it in order to get an innocent man out of prison. It's suggested in the book that Sarah had something called long QT syndrome. Unexpected drownings of young and healthy individuals is unfortunately a way that a lot of family members find out that their loved one even had long QT to begin with. So long QT, long QT is basically a heart rhythm condition. So your heart beats chaotically and this can be triggered from medications. It can even be triggered from uh, an increase in emotions. So if you get really excited or really sad or really anxious, um, there's a quick change in emotions. It can cause your heart to stop beating at a normal rhythm. And usually, and most people that have long QT, it will calm itself down. Your heart will get back onto a proper rhythm, but sometimes for people with long QT, it does not. And this can result in sudden death, cardiac arrest. Um, people can pass out from this. And then when they come to their heart has regulated itself. Just interesting because it states that long QT 
it explains a lot of random initially thought unexplained drownings until the person is tested for it. Now, Ryan's brother and the, um, you know, the reporter, the writer of Submerged have all stated that they really want to test her DNA for this because they strongly believe it's possible. But apparently a lot of other people have come forward since then stating that it's not very likely she had long QT syndrome. So aside from a heart murmur, Sarah had a couple of other health issues as well. She was born with a cleft palate and then she had the heart murmur and those on like on their own could be indicators that there's some sort of genetic condition. Um, and when she was 10 months old, she had to get surgery for her cleft palate and she had an EKG prior to this and they did not find any evidence of long QT. And they even had access to this EKG, the different pictures of it later on more recently. And another person looked over it, another expert, and did not see evidence of long QT. Now, experts have said it's not impossible for it to develop as she aged, but it's also not likely in the slightest. So from what I'm seeing, it's just not likely this is actually a thing. It's not likely she had long QT syndrome. Also, it doesn't explain the headaches or the sleeping um, or the sleepiness at least. It doesn't explain any of that. Those are not symptoms of long QT syndrome. I've also seen that she had a physical shortly before her death and I haven't seen it stated that he even brought up her heart murmur and I know because I have one that it can eventually just go away. Um, but I don't know if that was the case for her, if at the most recent physical, her heart murmur had gone away or um, all I know is that nothing was really seen at that physical out of the ordinary. But many other syndromes are questioned in the book and I haven't finished it yet. So I don't know what other ones in specific may have been brought up. I've only seen long QT, um, but there are other things leading this reporter and a lot of Ryan's family and Ryan to believe that she may have had a genetic condition. So apart from her cleft palate and her heart murmur, she also had very low set ears, like very low set ears and a very small lower mandible or lower jaw. Um, she was short of stature. She was also 5'1", and I know plenty of people that are 5'1", that doesn't necessarily indicate anything, but all of those things together are typically things that indicate there's some sort of genetic disorder, condition, something. I know that it is speculated that she may have had narcolepsy and that could potentially explain her sleepiness and maybe the narcolepsy caused her to fall asleep and that could explain why she didn't naturally wake up going into the water. I've also done my own research and seen that there is something called cataplexy, which is technically a symptom of narcolepsy where you basically lose your muscle tone suddenly, which means that if she was in the bathtub and lost her muscle tone, she could have easily slipped under and not been able to get herself up and then not splash so there wouldn't have been any water. She wouldn't have been struggling per se um, physically because she wouldn't have been able to move. But I don't know if narcolepsy is something that can be found through her DNA. But I will say I did stumble across a very interesting comment that caught my attention when I started to research it. Someone commented on a YouTube video. It was like a random news clip that I was looking into in this case and the woman said that it sounded like she had something called Anderson to Will syndrome, which is technically a form of long QT syndrome. So it apparently causes all the same things that long QT syndrome causes, which is, um, you know, heart rhythm issues. And it also comes with physical abnormalities. So things like a smaller lower mandible, and low set ears, widely spaced eyes, curving of toes and fingers, short stature. And I don't want to assume someone's medical condition, but she definitely did fit into a lot of those things. Um, she had a lot of the different physical um, attributes of someone with this Anderson to Will syndrome. Now, the one thing again that this can lead to, this long QT syndrome or this different type of long QT syndrome that I just mentioned is cardiac arrest. And from my understanding, cardiac arrest and a heart attack are not the same. And it's obvious to tell when a heart attack happens because there's a blockage of blood flow, but cardiac arrest is just when your heart suddenly stops unexpectedly. And I don't know 
Again, let me know if you know better down below. I don't know if it's possible to determine that that happened in an autopsy. If your heart just suddenly stops beating, I don't know if that leaves a, a sign of anything, if that makes sense. But ultimately, I think that with all of that information that seems to be you know, floating around in the air and questionable along with the fact that she had headaches and wasn't feeling well that day, I don't understand why the DNA hasn't been tested yet. And a judge has specifically denied, I think even more than once, that the DNA be tested, which is frustrating because the whole purpose of a justice system is to make sure that every possible scenario has been kind of run down and played out. And usually if there is another possibility in a murder trial, that possibility has to be ruled out before you can move forward and prove someone guilty. And so I find it very bizarre that this DNA could potentially offer some bit of information. It's just not being looked into. The book also revealed that in Ryan's initial statement to authorities, he mentioned that Sarah kissed him on the forehead and then walked away on her tiptoes like she normally did. And this was never brought up in any of the trials from what I'm understanding. I believe that the author of this book, the reporter found this information and was able to realize, you know, that's actually another indicator that some health issue may have been happening. And for those of you that are not aware, unfortunately I have experience in this. So I am aware that walking on your tiptoes can be a sign of a neurological problem. Or it could just be that you have very tight Achilles tendons. It's like one of those things where it could be extreme or it could be totally explainable. In a nutshell, there's plenty of red flags here. There's plenty of information that has been introduced that indicates that she could have been suffering from something health-wise. Lion is just so split in this case because there's plenty of people out there that believe that he is without a doubt guilty. And then there's people that were even jurors from his previous trials that have come forward and now are some of his biggest supporters trying to have this DNA tested, saying that if they had known about these different things um, and if they knew that there was testable DNA, that they would have pushed for it and wouldn't have made the decision that they did prior. Actually, lots of demonstrators. One of the voices from the press conference today coming really from a unique perspective, a juror from the second trial. She spoke today saying she wants every stone unturned on the investigation, and that includes the release of DNA evidence. They come for their own reasons. The reason I'm here today is to remember Sarah with her favorite flowers, crazy daisies. 10 years after Sarah Widmer's death, a group hopeful, wanting the Warren County Prosecutor's Office to release her DNA to Widmer's defense team. So we can have them done testing on uh, to determine what sort of disease, and we feel there was a good chance she had this long QT syndrome. Um, her head, her constant headaches or sleepiness she seemed to have all the time. The argument, Sarah had a rare genetic disorder that may have caused the accidental drowning. Ryan Widmer is still appealing for a new trial, and a decision from a federal judge could come at any time. There's a, a life on the line, a human life on the line. This is very important. Janet Kaywood was a juror in Widmer's second trial. She tells Nine on Your Side she felt the outcome of that trial could have been different instead of a hung jury had DNA evidence been released. As a juror, our deliberations started out. Well, in the beginning, I could tell that a majority of the jurors felt that Ryan was guilty. As we deliberated more and went through the evidence, you could see that, uh, that more jurors were at least on the fence about it. A family holds out hope that Sarah could have died from a medical condition and not at the hands of her husband. We feel most confident it could be a good possibility what she had. You know, I mean, I think, you know, every test we could figure out and run, we would. Um, if, it, if everything were to come back negative, it still wouldn't change my mind about anything. And I've called the Warren County Prosecutor's Office for comment on all of this. We've yet to hear back, but when we do, we'll be sure to keep you updated on WCPO.com as well as right here on WCPO. Jake Ryle, 9 on your side. I think the largest thing that stands out for me is just I feel like it's been a total failure in terms of the justice system and what should happen when someone is on trial. I feel personally, based on everything that I have seen, I feel like the prosecution repeatedly contradicted themselves and started a bunch of open-ended possibilities with hopes that the jurors would fill in the blanks for themselves and eventually lead to a guilty verdict 
And because of this, that would allow them to not have to present a singular conclusion, which would then have to be backed by physical evidence to prove beyond a reasonable doubt. I hope that statement I just made made sense, but I do. I think that's that was the prosecution's goal in every single trial was just we've got all of these weird things that are suspicious and people thrive on things that are suspicious. So if we just open end all of them and let the jurors decide what they think, maybe we can get away with not having like very solid, solid evidence. It's just so difficult because I'm so on the fence, honestly, with what I believe and my opinion on this. It said that there was no struggle in the bathroom. There was no water thrown everywhere in the bathroom as if there was a struggle. The prosecution suggested that this meant there was a cleanup. There was also absolutely no evidence of a cleanup other than a random Lysol wipe. I can assure you the Lysol wipe is not gonna get up a ton of water from you know someone drowning someone else. Also, there was no sign of wet towels anywhere. Again, the bathtub was still covered in print, so that wasn't wiped down despite that being probably the first place someone wanting to clean up a crime scene would have wiped down. But on the flip side, I think there is also a chance that she could have been drowned without there being a mess. So maybe this focus on the lack of mess is potentially hiding what could have happened that would fit the scenario, if that makes sense. Like again, putting her under just the running water and drowning her that way. I have seen that that was suggested, so clearly that's possible. And I think that would easily explain how there wasn't a lot of mess because there wasn't a lot of just sitting water in the bathtub. Maybe it's possible that Ryan was upstairs watching the football game, she was downstairs. Maybe there was an argument over something dumb and he just kind of snapped. What if he followed her in the bathroom when she said she was gonna take a bath and as the water was just starting to run, he then drowned her in it. You know, her body would have been out of the bathtub for the most part, making her hair wet and her body dry and probably not getting a lot of water all over the bathroom. Also, when it comes to Ryan's contradictions, he said something in the Reasonable Doubt episode that bothered me and it also bothered those that were um, the hosts of the show. He said that he almost dropped Sarah taking her out of the bathtub because she was so slippery, indicating that he's saying she was in fact very wet, wet enough for him to almost drop her. So that means in the matter of those three minutes, she did fully dry. And that would also indicate she would have been dripping water all over the place coming out of the bathroom. So was he just saying that to try to add dramatics to his storytelling version of his events, which is that she drowned accidentally? Or was he saying that to try to prove that she was in fact in the bathtub and he had to take her out? I don't know, it's again, I wish there was more evidence to kind of point directly one way or another. He definitely drowned and we just don't know how that happened. I personally don't think I believe that her full body was ever in the water. Um, you know, EMTs did say that she was warm. When they got there, her body was just dry. So whatever did happen to her didn't happen too long before 911 was called. But in that same breath, I just cannot understand how there were no defensive wounds. There was no sign of a struggle, no sign of defensive wounds on either of them. And if things happened as quickly as it makes sense in that timeline where she may have been murdered and a 911 immediately called and police get there fast enough for her body to still be warm, I can't see how there could have been a very easy cleanup um, in that short time frame, especially when most of that was spent on the actual phone with the dispatcher. And then also, again, just the lack of wounds on him or evidence on her that there was any sort of fight. Bottom line to me is that I don't know if he, I believe he is guilty or not guilty, but again, I do believe that there is enough reasonable doubt here and there is a total lack of substantial evidence. I think every single bit of evidence introduced in this was just circumstantial evidence and I'm honestly surprised that they got a conviction because I do think the prosecutor's argument from what I've seen was very, very weak. It has been said that the jurors probably erred on the side of caution because it is scary to think that there is a man out there that we could see as being totally innocent and harmless. And what if he did snap? And a lot of people have theorized that these jurors found him guilty because they felt there was enough of a chance that he did snap, that he could be a danger to other people. So they wanted to put him in prison. I'm interested to see what you guys think about this. Are you on the fence like I am? Or do you think he's guilty? Or do you think he's not guilty? Is there anything in this that no one has seen before that I haven't mentioned that 
you think could be plausible? Do you see any other scenarios as to where he could have drowned her without there being any sort of defensive wounds or any markings on either of them, just period? I think the DNA needs to be tested. I don't see how testing the DNA would cause any problems, period. Because in my opinion, if the DNA proves she had an underlying illness, that is important. It is going to potentially help and or save someone else in her family um, to understand also that someone that they all care about didn't really kill their daughter. Also, in my opinion, with the lack of evidence could prove that he did nothing and that an innocent man would be released from prison. And all the people that have been supporting him this entire time and remaining by his side saying there's no way he would do this, they would get some form of closure. And if the DNA comes back showing that there was nothing, it makes it that much more likely that he maybe just somehow miraculously managed to murder his wife on a whim with no, no even prior run-ins with law enforcement ever before, no criminal record, no criminal history, and something just happened and he snapped and we may never understand why. But I think the DNA will help bring a lot of closure and clarity and understanding in this case, and I really hope they do eventually test it. But that was a long one. I've lost my voice at this point. I can't wait to see what you guys think about this. But on that note, you guys, thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to listen to Brian and Sarah's story. Hopefully one day this is on one of my updates videos where we have answers on the DNA and maybe some more understanding here. But I'm gonna go ahead and go, you guys. If you haven't already, hit the subscribe button down below to become a part of the Howland fam so that we can hopefully bring them home together. And I will see you guys in my next video. Bye.